Hello, hi. I, I, hello, I'm uh, Reinhold Martin, and uh, I uh, direct the Temple Hoyne Buell Center for the Study of American Architecture here at Columbia, um, Columbia University. And I am here to welcome you uh, to the panel, uh, Creative Extraction, uh, a conversation on concept development uh, in which Danielle Purifoy and Louise Seamster will present their conceptual framework for understanding black towns with an extractive white space, highlighting questions of citizenship, extraction and exclusion as they focus on how legal, spatial, racial and economic systems structure black spaces access to infrastructure and facilitate environmental violence. But before we begin, uh, two things. First, uh, I want to note and acknowledge that dispersed as we may be here uh, on the screen, there is a very good chance that most, if not all of us, sit on occupied land. The temporarily decentered Buell Center, along with the Columbia campus and its New York neighborhood, Morningside Heights, from where I join you today, are located in Lenape Hoking, uh, the unceded ancestral homeland of the Lenape peoples whose violent displacement was central to the colonial establishment and growth of New York City. As you'll see, land will remain in the frame uh, for this evening's discussion. And so I invite you to think uh, about the, um, let's say, manifest and latent connections. Second, I, I wanna say with really sincere gratitude to our, our guests of honor, um, uh, Danielle and Louise, uh, that this conversation is among the outcomes of, uh, of several years of, of collaborative, if intermittent, but always sort of present exchange, uh, beginning with, with discussion <clears throat> of the use of emergency, that, that actually began with a discussion on, on the use of emergency powers in Flint, Michigan, um, but evolved in a variety of way to, ways to the topics that we're gonna discuss this evening. Uh, during which exchange we at the Buell Center have, have learned enormously from Danielle and Louise's work. Um, they, they'll explain to you that work's central concept, created, uh, and they do, do, do the same in two articles that we want to share with you. Uh, I think we can put those in the link um, that were supported, have been over these years, supported by the Buell Center's uh, Power and Infrastructure Project, the first article uh, is, is titled, What is Environmental Racism for in Environmental Sociology? And the second um, is uh, titled, Creative Extraction, Black Towns in White Space in Environmental Planning D, Society and Space. These articles uh, focus on the case of Tamina, Texas, an unincorporated black community dating back to 1836 to demonstrate how mundane or at least apparently mundane local development practices. Uh, and in a sense, this is, this is the, the, the learning in which we've all engaged. Seemingly mundane local development practices such as municipal utility districts, planning jurisdictions and sales tax structures are routinely used to leverage the value and resourcefulness of white places at the expense of black places. In our conversation, Louise and Danielle will discuss how their individual research on seemingly disparate black places. Uh, rural black founded towns and urban majority black cities led to a series of inquiries culminating with, with uh, what we can call the creative extraction hypothesis. So I, I really wanted to, to acknowledge and appreciate the, the sort of, um, you know, the kind of, uh, the sort of background culture that, that, that we've shared in the conversations over these few years. Uh, with Louise and Danielle in a variety of contexts. Uh, and, and now we're very pleased and quite proud, in fact, to, to be able to share them with you um, and, and to invite you into, into, uh, into the conversations as well. So, so that conversation will, I will recede from all of this uh, for the time being. And, and the conversation, in fact, will be led and moderated by uh, my colleague, uh, Columbia colleague, and our Buell Center, uh, member of the Buell Center uh, Advisory Board, um, Catherine Fennell. Uh, and so uh, after which there'll be an opportunity, Louise and Daniel will present their work and then and Cassie will ask uh, a series of follow-up questions. They'll engage in a conversation and, and they'll, uh, then there'll be an opportunity for a kind of Q&A 
exchange with, with uh, participants, audience members uh, after that. So that's just basically the, the structure of, of the evening. Um, so now I'll just uh, quickly introduce uh, our, our guests and, and we'll go straight to, to that conversation. So Danielle Purifoy is a lawyer and assistant professor of geography uh, at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, her research focuses on environmental justice and the racial politics of development in black towns and communities. Danielle serves as board chair of the North Carolina Envi Environmental Justice Network and on the leadership team of Durham Beyond Policing in Durham, Durham North Carolina. She's the former race and place editor of Scalawag um, as well, a media organization devoted to Southern storytelling, journalism, and the arts. Louise Seamster is an assistant professor in sociology and criminology and African-American studies at the University of Iowa. Uh, Dr. Seamster's research centers on racial politics and urban, urban development, emergency, emergency financial management, debt, uh, and the myth of racial progress. Another line of research, for example, uh, uh, examines racial disparities uh, in debt. And in fact, worth mentioning is her work on predatory inclusion in student debt that has, that led, uh, has led to extensive policy advocacy, including research informing Senator Elizabeth Warren's student debt forgiveness plan. Uh, Louise's current book project investigates the financial and political causes of the Flint water crisis. So that really brings us full circle to where we began uh, this conversation, as as I said, and so again to to um, to moderate and and to engage in a, in a discussion uh, with Louise and Danielle after they they present uh, they basically summarize their arguments and and present and summarize the, the the sort of results of their research is is Catherine Finnell, an urban anthropologist and associate professor of anthropology at Columbia University with a joint appointment in the Center for the Study of Ethnicity and race also here at Columbia. Uh, Cassie's work examines how the social and material legacies of 20th century urbanism shape the policies of social difference, collective obligation, and utopian imagination in the, in the United States. Uh, and, and her work has been supported by the National Science Foundation, the University of Minnesota Press, and uh, the Russell Sage Foundation. Um, uh, Fennell's first book, uh, I, you know, which must be read from by everybody in this audience, I really need to say, uh, is a study of public housing reform in Chicago, uh, a really landmark uh, piece of research and, and, and a sort of exposition uh, of uh, a kind of an elegy in, in, in many ways, at least uh, as I've uh, come to, to understand this work, uh, to um, uh, public housing in some ways, uh, its attempts at reform, uh, and, and, and in particular, the lives lived uh, there um, in, in Chicago in, in these large public housing projects. The title of the book is Last Project Standing, uh, and, and it won deservedly the 2016 Book Prize from the Association of Political and Legal Anthropology. And in fact, um, Cassie is now currently at work on a new research, on new research uh, concerning the aftermath of private homes uh, in the late industrial urban Midwest. And so now I, I, I offer, I, I give the screen to uh, Danielle and Louise, and I think they're gonna sort of take it from here and welcome so much uh, to the Decentered Buell Center, <laughs> to our ongoing conversation. Thank you so much, Arnold. Um, and thank you to, um, yeah, thanks so much to all the folks at the Buell Center and particularly Reinhold, um, Jacob and Jordan, um, it's been really tremendous to collaborate with you over the last um, few, more than a few years at this point. Um, so um, yeah, thank you for all of your support um, and for bringing us together today. Um, Danielle's right. gonna get us set up with sharing the screen. Okay, well, cool. I talk about it first. <laughs> All right. Hey, Louise. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's get started here. Oh, wait, hold on. Okay. Play from the start. All right. Cool. So um, the way we're going to do this today is we wanted to show some slides 
less to do a formal lecture and more to have images that we're sharing in common when we're thinking of these places. Um, and because we have been thinking visually about these ideas and, and you'll see how. Um, and, and so we're gonna kind of switch off telling pieces of this story tonight and then and then we'll hopefully segue as smoothly as we can into uh, like a broader discussion. Um, so where we started with our separate projects, um, as Reinhold said, I um, first started conversations with Buell Center in, in 2017 based on my work on emergency management. Um, my dissertation was on um, a city in Michigan that had been taken over by the state. You probably have heard of Detroit's bankruptcy, which was a much more famous iteration of the same process. Um, and I, uh, Danielle and I actually went to college together um, <laughs> long, long ago, and then met back up when Danielle started a PhD at Duke, where I was already getting a PhD at Duke. And, um, and then like, actually after I moved away, we realized that we had a lot in common in, in how we were thinking about our respective dissertation projects. And we spent a year or two just talking through why we felt like we had so much in common in our findings and then in outcomes in the different cases we were looking at when according to the literature, we shouldn't be. So I was looking at um, uh, majority black cities in the Midwest um, that are more like what we think of when we think of as a city, um, but uh, that had a history of black governance and also of um, state receivership. And um, so these were cities that were formed as black cities through white flight. Um, and um, this image on the left is, is from William Bung, who was a radical cartographer in uh, Detroit. Um, and he was showing contrary to this image of, that we have often of, of places like Detroit as like kind of a drain on the rest of the state. He was making um, an argument about how look at how the resources of Detroit are, are being sucked out into the suburbs and especially into the, the, the wealthier um, areas. Um, and you, you know, feel free to Google this on your own sometime, but you can, you know, in these little arrows, you can see all kinds of vectors of um, resource flows that are moving out from the like opportunity cost of having to take the bus three hours every day to um, exploitative rents, uh, to taxes, to all kinds of different ways of conceiving of resources. And this has been a useful image in my work to think about what I was describing as extraction in Benton Harbor and how a city that was construed of as like not having resources from within, people were saying, we have lots of resources and lots of attention and interest in taking them all. Um, and that is why, you know, it's not just disinvested in, but that they were describing an ongoing process of exploitation and extraction. And then on the other hand, Danielle was studying um, the case of these um, unincorporated majority, well, you, often all black towns in the South, they're often very small, um, often just a couple hundred people. Um, and, and these technically shouldn't be the same place. Like they shouldn't be having the same experiences because we're supposed to, you know, we keep getting told these two th places have nothing in common. How can you relate to them, to each other? Um, because this experience of unincorporated black places should not look like the experience of incorporated white flight derived black cities. And yet we kept seeing like, oh yeah, that was happening here in my town, in the town I'm studying, this was happening over there too. And just, and so we are, we spent a long time trying to just identify what, what was the what, <laughs> why they, why they had something in common so, to go beyond, you know, in my work, I'm, I've been studying towns under emergency management, but not emergency management directly so much as trying to figure out what is the case that I'm trying to identify. Um, and that was what, where we came from. Great. Yeah. So um, as Louise was saying, you know, we're trying to connect these places that seem um, incompatible. And um, I guess one other thing about um, my own research is that um, a lot of these places, uh, you know, 
that I was looking at these unincorporated black communities were um, in the South, um, often um, uh, situated on uh, the land of former plantations um, or quite close to places where um, the people living there, their um, predecessors were, um, or ancestors had been enslaved. Um, and then often um, right directly kind of adjacent to um, a lot of um, white communities um, and white towns that um, had some historical, right, um, relationship to, um, to the black uh, communities there. Um, and so this sort of extraction machine that um, Louise is describing, um, I was noticing um, similar processes happening, um, resource flows out of um, places like you see here, this is in North Carolina, Jackson Hamlet and Monroe Town, places shaded in black um, to um, places that ostensibly um, are considered um, good places to live, right? Like solid, well-to-do places like um, Pinehurst and Aberdeen, um, which if you know anything about golf is where a lot of, um, they, they host like the US Open and those sorts of places, those sorts of events. Um, so we, you know, after, um, you know, this took uh, a while for us to kind of situate ourselves um, around some key questions um, and to connect these things to, um, literatures that we knew um, on uh, like Charles Mills's The Racial Contract um, and uh, Cedric Robinson's uh, Racial Capitalism. Um, and so three um, sort of main questions emerged for us. Um, the first was just what are the common development patterns observed in Black towns? And when we say Black towns, we are um, we're not referring to kind of how you might imagine a town um, necessarily, right? Um, just as a kind of municipal, a small municipal unit. Um, we're really referring to the kind of full spectrum um, of uh, black places, whether they are black founded, right? Communities like the ones I work in or black um, places kind of created by white flight. Um, the second question, um, was how do these those development patterns compare with those of white towns? So we were really trying to understand um, what's the relationship there um, between um, the black towns and the white towns sort of um, getting uh, down to the brass tacks of um, some of what uh, Louise was talking about with the urban extraction machine. Um, and then third, um, thinking about how existing theories um, that we knew about, right, of like racial capitalism and development um, help to explain, right, the, um, uh, what is commonly termed in like geography um, and in sociology as the uneven development um, between black and white um, towns or places. Okay, um, one other thing that was very clear, um, and this is kind of funny, but also ended up being really generative for us, um, is that um, as you know, contemporaries, um, we both grew up um, thinking about um, place making, and particularly at this kind of scale uh, through Richard Scarry's uh, Busy Town, um, and we were, um, you know trying to, we came to this by trying to think about, um, kind of trying to answer the question, like, what is a town? How do we think of a town? Um, because this research has really made us have to really scale back a lot of our assumptions, right, about what um, these place designations that we have are. Um, and so we, um, we pivoted, we were just like, well, you know, our earliest memories um, of thinking about towns um, are through, you know, is through this children's literature. Um, and one of the things that was super generative about it was um, the way that it um, portrayed a kind of uh, commonwealth, right? And a kind of um, uh, principle of development that was for, for all people, right? Um, um, a very kind of common um, or dominant kind of construction of how we think about um, a town or why people will want to come together to form um, some form of town. And so it was really helpful for us to kind of 
uh, go back um, to how a town is even created in our own, like our earliest imaginations, um, and to sort of build from there, to get from there to what we were actually observing in our research. Um, so, and we'll show you um, a kind of other rendering, um, another illustration later that gets at more of what we were seeing. Um, so, so Louise and I um, ended up uh, looking for a while for a, a case that um, really kind of captured or had some elements of um, the various issues that we have been talking about in tandem. So um, we wanted to learn more about uh, Black place development. Uh, we wanted to know um, a bit more about what incorporation, municipal incorporation, right? Like what is its real tie um, to um, development outcomes? There is a, um, in, in my own research, there's this sort of dominant um, conceptualization of uh, the municipality that, um, that is really kind of synonymous with development, right? You, you form a municipality with every intention of um, having some form of development. Um, and um, if you are unincorporated, there appears to be some kind of, um, uh, you know, individualization, right, of, or atomization of um, your sense of space, right? You're not necessarily belonging to a, um, a community or a commonwealth. Um, you don't necessarily have the public resources um, available to you to develop how you will. So we wanted to really understand um, what are the racialized dimensions of, of incorporation? So we were looking for, um, we call like a negative case, right? We were looking for a white unincorporated place um, that could help us understand something about uh, development <laughs> um, in um, under a regime where you don't have a municipal government. And we landed um, on this place called the Woodlands, which you may be in Texas, which you may be familiar with. It's about, uh, I would say maybe 40-ish minutes um, north of Houston. Um, it's part of the sort of greater Houston suburban area. And it's one of the, um, the HUD model communities of the 1970s. Um, that was formed by an, uh, an oil baron named James uh, George P. Mitchell. Um, and so, yeah, the woodlands didn't look, in, and Louise will talk about this a little later, the woodlands looks nothing <laughs> um, like any of the unincorporated places that are discussed in the literature, namely, um, you know, those places are discuss, uh, discussed often as places that don't have very much infrastructure um, that really lack um, a lot of basic services, um, you know, and sometimes they're when they are a little wealthier, they can provide some of those things by themselves. Um, but the woodlands is a is a different kind of um, animal, even than just a kind of wealthy, right, uh, wealthy ish, right, unincorporated place. It really has the feel of a of a city, actually, um, not just a town. Um, but what we also found um, right adjacent, as it turns out, to the woodlands um, is another unincorporated uh, black founded community that dates back to 1836 called Tamina. Um, and very quickly, as we did this research, just cursory <laughs> uh, research online, found that Tamina had been in an at least 20 year fight and actually 30 years, if you can include fights against land grabs. Um, but a 20 year fight, um, at least against um, uh, a small unincorporated city of Shenandoah um, and the woodlands around um, access to basic infrastructure. Now, Tamina preceded uh, the, the woodlands and all of these other places um, by well over a hundred years. Um, and it actually established its own water utility company um, just as the woodlands in Shenandoah and those areas were developing. And so it actually had water rights that you know, predated these places. Um, but um, as we learned, um, as these white places started to grow around them, um, they ended up encroaching on those water rights. Um, and, and as you know, if you, you know, have, um, if you don't have access to basic water and um, sanitation systems, um, you know, your development is, 
essentially dead in the water. Um, so we decided that this was a really interesting um, case to really kind of triangulate um, three places that we mostly focused on, um, the woodland, Shenandoah, and Tamina. Um, the Shenandoah is a kind of place that is a, um, it's, it, as our, um, uh, the uh, attorneys for Tamina said, they sort of are aspirational, right? It's an aspirational white space um, that is really um, striving uh, to be like the woodlands. Um, and Tamina really represents a kind of barrier uh, to its development. Um, so we, um, yeah, so we in 2018 um, traveled um, to, to this region in Montgomery County, um, Texas, to really um, to do interviews, um, to do some uh, more archival research, and actually to kind of look around to, to start to understand um, what the feel of um, these places were, how close they were. Um, and we attended a couple of um, public meetings in Shenandoah as well, uh, planning commission and city council meetings um, to really understand how they were thinking about development. Um, okay, um, so this is just to give you a feel. Um, so this is the entrance, um, around the entrance to Tamina. Um, it is like so many, um, we think of um, Black communities cut off or segregated Black communities, um, separated um, by, uh, from Shenandoah and the Woodlands by a railroad, as you see here. And then also, um, I think it's Interstate 45, uh, which is also kind of runs parallel in a sense to the, um, to the railroad tracks. And um, uh, one of the things that we noticed um, coming in, um, and I, you know, in particular noticed as someone who studies environmental racism, is that, you know, you really can, um, you know, Tamina is a very easy case, right, of um, how we think of environmental racism. Um, this is the Sweet Rest Cemetery, uh, which um, is now pretty consistently underwater and has been um, since uh, the early 2000s or the actually mid to late 2000s. Um, and part of how this happened was because of um, construction waste um, and illegal dumping that was happening from uh, the woodlands into, um, into Tamina, basically kind of shifted um, a bit uh, the geographic landscape and um, basically causing this, this flooding to recur pretty consistently. So they haven't been able to bury any, um, uh, any of their dead since two, um, 2007. And, and I'm gonna turn it over to Louise to talk about the contrast with Shenandoah and the woodlands. Thank you. Um, so, so Danielle has just laid out Tamina in a little bit of its context um, in, in this present tense, but um, if you're thinking back to that map that Danielle was just showing uh, a few slides earlier, um, and Tamina is pretty small, the woodlands is pretty big, uh, Tamina's historical footprint actually covered all of this area. So what is now Shenandoah, the woodlands, Chateau Woods, and even beyond was all the town of Tamina. So all of this development is, is literally built on land that used to belong to Tamina. And um, the, the closest town um, that is incorporated to Tamina is Shenandoah. And when we were just studying this place from afar, we were framing this more as a Tamina woodland scenario. But when we got there, we were like, Shenandoah is the one right in the middle. Shenandoah is the, is the town that is like the, the most open aggressor against Tamina. It, it had um, cut off Shen, uh, Tamina's water line and moved it to convenience itself. It had overlapped its water certificate, uh, like uh, rights of provision uh, map. So that, and that was what had caused like some of the most recent legal battles where um, Shenandoah was the direct um, entity preventing Tamina from getting full water coverage, coverage and sanitation hookups. So um, we wanted to understand like kind of what was the psychological profile of Shenandoah and like why it was how it was. And um, which is partly why we were there for these town meetings where, you know, in the town hall is a this 
framed picture of their mall, which is their main source of income through sales tax, and is also just directly across the street. So you, you could walk outside and look at it, or I mean, by the street, I mean across this 12 lane highway. So if you could see it from afar, there it is. But they also were so proud of it as this beautiful object. And so we've been thinking a lot about like, what this form of development means um, for these towns, not just financially in terms of the resources that it brings to them as far as a regressive way of funding their town, but also as an aesthetic, um, you know, feeling about what it means to be Shenandoah and they're, they're trying to be like the Woodlands despite being a town of 2000 people um, that has kind of little hope of becoming a, uh, having all of its rights um, because it's, its growth is dependent on Tamina basically ceasing to exist because that's its only direction it can expand into. And um, so we've been thinking about what it means to feel like they could at any moment become the Woodlands when they're not going to become the Woodlands anytime soon. And, and um, why, you know, what part Tamina plays symbolically and materially for, for this small town. Um, and, and then we also were thinking about the woodlands in this as well. So if you move to the next slide, Danielle, thank you. Um, I will just set up a brief clip. I feel like the best way to introduce this, the woodlands itself, as far as how it looks, is to show you this promotional video that um, the woodlands has of itself. So remember that this is an unincorporated place. Um, it's technically not a city or a town. It's, but it's got over 100,000 residents. It's one of the wealthiest places um, in the country. And um, it won't incorporate because it doesn't uh, want to have to provide all of the services that you will see in this video, uh, have to pay for them themselves through city taxes. They currently get a lot of services provided by the county like road um, construction and repair but they don't want to not incorporate because they're afraid of being annexed by Houston. So this is this kind of perennial problem where um, they're trying to maximize both the benefits of unincorporation and, um, and think about, uh, you know, av avoid the, the harms of being unincorporated. Um, and I, and so, you know, I think th this town is kind of a common like planning case study town that people pull out as like, this was an intentionally planned master community. It had federal money to get started in the model cities program. I mean, people kind of study it as an exception in an analogous way to how they often study black unincorporated places as exceptions. So we wanted, instead of um, thinking of them both as, as like unusual categories, but to think, how does this look like a lot of places that we've been? And if so, why? <laughs> so why does this, you know, I was just in Chicago this weekend. This is plausibly, you know, an area of Chicago too. And like, so what, how did they man make an unincorporated area look like a real city? Um, and what does that mean about our legal designation supposedly producing a city if, if it can do so? Um, and how do we then, you know, watch this and keep in mind not only you could count how many pieces of infrastructure you could see, like not just limited to roads, but like waterways, transportation, um, water provision, um, uh, you know, biking trails. Um, but to think about them relationally, which is kind of a social science concept to think not just about a disparity of one place to another, but how did this place come about at Tamina's expense? Um, I mean, in, Danielle was just talking about showing pictures of Sweet Rest Cemetery, the refuse from the construction of these buildings that we are looking at may be in the landfills that are causing the cemetery to be flooded. So that's an example of what it means to be thinking relationally and not just seeing, we're used to seeing these videos kind of floating in space as if these cities were kind of born out of nothing. And what we're doing is insisting that they're never born out of nothing. And they're often built out of, whether it's in Tamina's case, literally built out of a black place, but often more metaphorically just built at their expense. So if you start the video, we will watch it. It is two minutes long.
All right, I'm, I'm going to turn things over to Danielle to uh, um, switch to the imagery that we were working on instead to show that relationality and then basically to bring us home. All right, awesome. So, um, um, yeah, so we, you know, as we um, were looking at the woodlands and looking at Tamina and talking to um, talking to the residents in, um, in Tamina about, um, yeah, the history of their fight um, against uh, Shenandoah, um, the way that the woodlands actually kind of inserted itself as a kind of um, a benefactor in this kind of interesting way, despite this history, right, of, of dumping in the community. Um, uh, there was actually, um, uh, an organization they formed that I don't know if it's, I don't think it still exists called the Friends of Tamina, um, where uh, the Woodlands actually kind of inserted itself in to Tamina's fight against Shenandoah for its water rights, um, but then subsequently advocated, right, for Tamina to um, essentially give up its water rights in exchange for getting access, right, to um, access to the access and expansion of the water system that it wanted, right? Um, and so there's this, um, yeah, we just saw this way that these white places, um, even at different scales, different levels of wealth that were surrounding Tamina had kind of um, had this sort of covenant, <laughs> um, it appeared, right? To, um, to ensure that, um, that Tamina couldn't have any kind of, um, couldn't maintain any sense of independence, right? So in one of our interviews with um, Mr. Uh, James Leviston, who's um, the president of the, the Old Tamina Water Supply Company um, and a lifelong uh, resident of the town, um, you know, what he had, uh, what he told us, um, you know, essentially was that uh, that water right, right? Like that's that's their one kind of thing that gives them an identity it has some form of state recognition. Um, and they were, um, you know, even the people who were trying to help them, <laughs> right? Were trying to get them to give it up. Um, so yeah, so we took um, all of these, um, you know, the, the media archives documenting this fight, the legal documentation, these interviews um, sitting in um, Shenandoah's um, planning commission and city council meetings. Um, we um, decided that, you know, there was, um, what we really needed was uh, another rendering, right? Um, kind of like using, taking the busy town uh, model um, and um, rendering it so that it reflected more of what we were seeing um, in terms of the relational development of, um, of, of Tamina and, you know, Shenandoah, the woodlands, whichever. And, um, you know, we, have observed these sorts of patterns before and since, right? In other, um, in other uh, historic black places, black founded places. And so, um, you know, we wanted to actually make this as kind of general as possible, um, but to sort of insert the elements of how development happened. So um, if you can kind of, um, so we commissioned an illustration by an amazing um, artist named Billy D um, to really help us to render this. And so um, you can see the, um, the, uh, the White Town Trash Company, right? Dumping um, illegally into, um, uh, into Blacktown. You can see the, the graveyard flooded. You can see the Black Town's water tower. And then you can see over here, right, White Town official cutting the water line um, as a means, right, of encroachment, right, as a means all for the sort of um, future expansion and development um, um, of White Town. Um, you can see um, White City, White Town City workers taking um, Black Town's um, uh, um, signage right to the, uh, the entrance away in preparation to expand. Um, we actually see, saw this happening in Tamina um, where they, um, you know, Tamina um, leaders told us, 
that um, they had been sort of encroaching and sort of taking down their signs and sort of moving them. Um, Shenandoah had, and then we were at a Shenandoah uh, County Commission, um, sorry, uh, City Council meeting, and the mayor was talking about, um, you know, literally that day, like reorienting, right, this area around the I-45, um, <clears throat> like highway, this sort of really tricky area and, and, and beautifying it because it was the new entrance to the city. Um, and so you could see we were like observing in real time just at sort of one meeting, right, like how um, these development aspirations of this um, of this white town um, were so predicated, right, on um, the disappearance and erasure, right, of both the identity and the actual existence, right, um, of, um, of Tamina. Um, so we want to just emphasize, right, like that what this means um, uh, is that, you know, this isn't just, this image isn't just about environmental racism via nimbyism, right? It's not just, oh, white town doesn't, just doesn't want its trash in its own town and it's gonna dump elsewhere. And that hurts, right, black town. It's that like white town creates value, right? More value in its place and more capability to develop in the way that it wants to um, uh, at the expense of, of black town, right? And it's actual, um, value, right? Like how it views its value is always relative, right? To the space that it can use as its dumping ground. So um, this is how we think of this as a, a, a model, right? For um, white place development. And we came up with a conceptual framework to, um, uh, to outline it. Hi, I forgot that was me. Um, so, <laughs> so um, for more, you'll have to read the papers, uh, both in both of which we um, do a lot more to define creative extraction, but we've kind of been talking around this concept this whole time. As far as a, a framework that can encompass all of these different things we're talking about um, and focusing on the process and the relationships rather than the specific areas in which it might appear. Um, it allows us to um, talk about things broadly and you might have encountered this or you're like, why does this town, it's facing gentrification and this town is dealing with urban renewals after effects and this town is facing infrastructure problems. Why they feel somewhat similar, but I don't have you know, the language to put my finger on how. And so that was why we have been um, thinking about creative extraction as a way to think about this relational form of development um, and, and the many ways in which it can be at the cost of, of uh, black places to create white development and, 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 to, and to not just say white cities often develop that way, but to say it's kind of foundational to white development, um, which we can, um, you know, make sense of through these lenses of racial capitalism, uh, colonialism, that we, you know, since, since the foundation of uh, the United States as a colony, that it has been predicated on taking resources, labor, and land um, from others, and valuing that all of those things in relation to each other. So one thing is valued because the other one is devalued. Um, if you move to the next slide, we have three main mechanisms and then a lot of different processes fit in under these various mechanisms, or you could watch them play out over time, um, you know, moving from one to another. Um, but, but most of the different forms of creative extraction we've observed fit into one or more of these categories, whether that's outright theft of resources. So that could be, um, using legal trickery to just take land um, or steal it. Um, uh, that could be um, appropriating finances that don't belong to you. It could mean uh, moving the, the line on the map and cutting the water line. Um, the second is gradual erosion. So that that is often over a, a much longer time scale, um, but it could mean kind of um, 
depriving, for instance, Tamina from being able to access it, build its own water infrastructure system, um, which means that over the long term, it's not able to develop in that and that it might have other downstream effects of not being able to build that. And so it can't, you know, people, individuals can't get loans to fix up their homes because they don't have the preconditions to um, to to accomplish that and you know so these have all these um, like feedback loop effects um, and 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 so we're putting kind of the the degradation of the environment within that within that uh, category as well and then thirdly um, we are thinking about political irrelevance as a major mechanism so that is usually um, uh, there, alongside these two other dynamics, there is often also a third thread in which um, uh, independent sovereign black governance at any scale, it could be like actual elected officials in as it is in the case of emergency management, or it could be in Tamina's case, they don't have a city hall, but they do have um, a water corporation. And so it can be um, both op direct opposition to the water or corporation, or it can be more of just um, so like an ongoing um, narrative that black governance is actually to blame for the lack of development. Uh, management is the problem uh, and, and kind of devaluing the significance of, of any form of black governance. Um, so just to wrap up here, there's a ton more we can say, and hopefully we'll be able to say more in the, the Q&A and discussion, um, kind of where we landed. Um, so, um, yeah, so for us um, in this research, we found um, that envir the environmental conditions of um, Black towns are eminently explainable through a critical race framework. Um, and so we think about the racial contract, we think about plantation power, we think about racial capitalism. And so we are trying to um, think about how those things uh, manifest through the kind of ordinary processes of um, local place development um, and how those uh, always land, right? Pretty reliably, right? With these really degraded um, environmental conditions in, um, in black towns. And so creative extraction um, is our relational framework um, that demonstrates um, rather than what, um, you know, Louise was, um, you know, demonstrating in the beginning, right, rather than the dominant um, narrative that um, places like Tamina, right, are a suck, right, on uh, public resources, um, that actually the opposite is true, right, that actually um, those, those places don't have the resources because those resources are actually um, taken <laughs> from them, um, and the uh, white places actually are the ones that are dependent upon those resources for the creation of wealth and, um, and development. Um, it's a standard um, development local development model that has a very long history. Um, and so creative extraction, you know, really importantly for us, um, refutes any notion of an independent development, <laughs> independent white development. Um, and that's so important, right? Because um, if, you know, if you think about how um, any um, planner, um, any um, advocacy group, right, approaches um, this question of, un, um, of uneven development, so much of it is that, is this, um, is this push for the disenfranchised community, right? Often like the black community, right? To get to a space where it looks more like the white place, right? That has all the resources. But if we take seriously, right, this relational development, um, we have to notice that that in itself is um, a farce, right? Like that idea that you could actually have the black place look like the white place when the white place like looks like it does because it's been extracting from the black place um, really helps us to understand, right? Like the 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 reliable replication um, of this and to understand like why we don't like um, 
we never quite get there, right? Right. We haven't seen right these um, black towns like get to a space of thriving. And if and if they do, right? Like there's very you know this is you know the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa massacre, right? If they they do get to some measure of wealth, um, we see that destroyed, right? There's a really long history of that. Um, so it creative extraction refutes the notion of independent white development as much as it rejects <laughs> this narrative, right? That's also part of this story um, of dysfunctional black places, right? So many of the black places that Louise looks at and that I look at um, when, you know, the, the story about them is that they don't have the resources because um, they're dysfunctional, they're corrupt, right? Um, they, they're incompetent. Right um, and um, you know reinforces some narrative about white um, competence and functionality um, rather than actually looking at how um, development um, fully operates. So um, we will stop there. Oops, um, and just say thank you once again to the Buell Center um, for supporting this research. Um, we, um, yeah, we just could not have done it without your support and um, we're going to keep going, <laughs> um, uh, you know, on our, we have so many more um, elements of this to unpack. Um, so we're excited to um, move it forward and um, yeah, and we couldn't have gotten here without your support. So um, yeah, here's our contact information if in, anyone wants to be in touch about the papers. Um, but um, yeah, we'll stop there and take any questions. Everyone ready for a conversation? I hope I hope you are, right? You, you were the most important people in the room. I just wanna thank you for this lovely presentation. I have to say that I have been excited about this work since 2014 when I, I heard Louise present, I think an early version of this. And I was like, oh, this is, where this is going. And then I got to hear Danielle and Louise start throwing around ideas in 2017. And so this project has been long in the making, but I wanna stress, hopefully the audience understands how timely it is to be engaging these topics, right? So we are at this moment where we're having an explicit racial reckoning in this country and the way that, that racism is built into space, right, in our country. And, um, you know, this isn't news for a lot of people who live under these conditions, right? So I think that, having a set of conceptual tools that force us to think relationally, as opposed to on terms of dysfunction, incompetence, corruption, the list goes on, is really critical to make sure that this racial reckoning isn't a blip, right? And that it can actually affect uh, the production of policy, right? Because these are not contingencies, right? These are policies, right? The production of policies and the rethinking of policies on really concrete terms, right? which graveyard gets flooded, right? Where does the shit flow? Where does the, et cetera, right? Really concrete terms that are questions of policy and not questions of incompetence, right? So that's just my broad framing for how excited I am that this work um, has gone where it's gone. And I wanna congratulate you both on it. And I look forward to reading the books that will emerge and celebrating them and, and putting them in front of uh, students, but also policymakers face. All right, so there, that's that. So my job uh, is a very delightful one. I get to kick off a conversation and I have a couple questions that are broad and I hope that they inspire uh, questions from the group, which I think you can put in is this right in the Q, there's a kind of Q&A box that is accessible to the audience. And I think that will be monitored by Reinhold. All right, so to, to start us off, um, I have some questions. So you, to start where you maybe ended, right? You, your work is clearly building on um, some really critical, right, kind of established, but critical and emerging paradigms that are getting a lot of traction in the world of, you know, critical race studies, critical sociology, critical, critical anthropology, critical geography. Um, so plantation futures, the racial contract, racial capitalism, right? So you're really uh, environmental racism, clearly indebted to these and thinking creatively with them. And I wanted to hear you, you touch a bit on this in your articles, but I'm hoping you can talk a bit more about, um, what the concept of creative extraction brings to the table that is perhaps you know on the edges of these other important conceptual frameworks but that you think is really 
important and needs traction at this moment. So I wanted to invite you to think about that, not of course to dismiss these really important frameworks, they are central to how critical race thinking and, and thinking about racism is happening, but also just where you want to take the conversation. I think this, this creative extraction framework is really promising. So I hope you could talk about that a bit. Um, I'll, I'll take a stab. Um, and thanks, Catherine. Thanks for um, bringing up the, the long trajectory of, of how long these types of projects really take. Um, and, and I appreciate you, Catherine, as, as the person who put us in touch with Buell in the first place uh, or brought uh, my and our work to, to Buell's attention. So I um, like we are coming full circle in many ways here. Um, but uh, I, uh, so I think like as a, a qualitative researcher, a social scientist, um, we are often, you know, if we're doing a case study, we are trying to explain the case fully. And there's different philosophies about how much you bring existing theory with you to your site. Um, and I do bring theory with me. I think most of us do in practice, but I think um, then you're also like always pushing on where is it not enough? And um, one thing that Danielle and I have talked about and hope to write about more is how um, we uh, learn a lot from how people in the places we go to themselves describe what's happening to them. And then we take that seriously as theory. Um, and they're often talking metaphorically and visually uh, about dynamics or they talk about processes or say, you know, they're talking often in ab uh, not abstracted terms, but more like a like almost theatrical terms, like they're, you know, they, they, they take you on this, this journey through a metaphor. Um, like I, I didn't really understand what was happening in Benton Harbor until somebody was like, Benton Harbor is on the table with fine diners ready. <laughs> um, uh, we're on the menu and there's fine diners sitting at this table ready to spend. And, and that sent me down a track of really understanding how these extraction processes were working, but he was talking metaphorically. And there were a lot of metaphors going around that same meeting. And so I have um, kind of begun and ended with taking ideas like that seriously. We found similar ones in Tamina um, that we could maybe get into, but, but that I think, um, you know, rather than starting from, can we find racial capitalism here? Or can we find gentrification here? Or can we find environmental racism here? We're trying to understand the storyline and the dynamics. And then that ended up um, becoming the framework um, so that you can explain gentrification and all these other processes through the larger framework when sometimes we're limited when we are looking for the thing. And yes, you'll find it. Uh, I think it can lead to some errors like, um, like in my work on Flint, some of the work showing how Flint's water crisis was tied to structural racism is kind of lit on Flint was redlined. And I'm like, if redlining caused a water crisis, we would have, we would have a, you know, an abject water crisis in every single city major city in, in the country. So it's not causal. So, but if you're looking for something, you will find it <laughs> because we've had all of these processes repeat so many places. So instead of looking for the thing, trying to understand the story, I think is, is more where, what got us to creative extraction and then drawing on again, like all of these existing and uh, frameworks and some of which are <laughs> in the past five years now being, discussed much more commonly, like racial capitalism is now a thing that you're allowed to talk about. Where, <laughs> frankly, when I was writing my dissertation, um, was not a, an option <laughs> available to, to be used uh, openly. Um, so there's been a, a, a large shift in the past few years about what we can talk about. And I think there is a good confluence of these ideas coming together. And there's more I could say, but I, but I will turn it over to Danielle instead of trying to think of more. Sure. I mean, I think you pretty much covered it. I think, um, you know, one way that I think about this is um, that I think is is useful is um, is scale. I think, you know, there's a way that we understand um, 
racial capitalism, um, colonialism, right? Like uh, through um, like in an international context, right? We have some sense of what that looks like. Um, but, um, you know, it, it, it feels um, in some way that when we talk about a, at the smaller scale, right? We, we tend to think um, that each of these sorts of processes has to be proved separately, right? As though, um, as though the United States, as an example, right, wasn't, um, wasn't constructed via colonial colonization and theft and all of these sorts of things. And so you get to a place where, you know, where, um, you know, I guess there's a, there's a progress narrative there, right? Um, um, about um, what a modern city or town looks like that couldn't possibly be doing the exact same things that um, you know their predecessors centuries earlier were doing, right? Um, you have to kind of uh, prove the concept, <laughs> right? Again, that it's uh, replicable, right, at multiple scales. So I think that's um, that's yeah, you know, there's. Um, um, what is it, Walter Rodney's, right? Like how Europe underdeveloped Africa um, and people, again, like people have, um, we have a, a long history of decolonial histories and literatures that help us understand um, extraction at that scale. Um, and, you know, to a certain extent, right? We have some sense, right? We have like some sense of um, inequities in cities, right? But but there's a lot of still discussion of these things as um as if as inequities as um, somehow kind of um, independent of one another in a way that can still lend itself to these narratives about dysfunctional black places, right? And highly competent, prepared, right? Like white places that um, are just in positioned well, right? To, um, to go after the resources in some sort of fair competition. So that's, um, yeah. So I think it's, um, it, it's important to, that's, you know, part of the reason why it's so important to keep in mind, right? Um, these other frameworks. And I think, you know, creative extraction, um, you know, there are, there are parallels and similarities right there at, at every scale, but creative extraction is, yes, yeah, specifically interested, right, in, in the local, um, specifically interested in those mechanisms that happen in cities and towns um, in ways that they don't necessarily happen, right, at the, at the, um, national and international level um, that can produce um, reliably similar outcomes at this smaller scale. Um, this is really exciting. You know, uh, um, you know, an anthropologist loves to talk about the metaphorical, right? People talk in, in metaphorical registers. And so I, I appreciate this big push to think relationally, right? And to think about these codependent relationships that are very hard to grasp when the object is often presented as pathology, right? So a black neighborhood, the black ghetto, right? All these ways that social scientists have a way of reifying these spaces as necessarily already problematic that cuts out this discussion of how they came to even be conceived of as problems and how so that also they were sources of enormous uh, value production, right? That make the good life possible somewhere else. And so I was actually um, a little, I, I wondered if the um, creative, extraction was even a little sanitized because I hear my collaborators and research collaborators, interlocutors use much stronger language. And I, I wondered if you, um, if you could talk about those more intense uh, uh, chains of like metaphorical association through which people grasp these, this codependent relationship that is very corrosive, right? It may be creative, maybe extractive, but extremely corrosive mm -hmm. and depleting, right? Yeah, I'm just curious. Yeah, um, I think that that those like those other uh, terms are really important too. So like there, yes, there's creative extraction, which may sound kind of nice, but but we definitely don't mean it that way. Um, and I think that uh, like when I was in the past few years, um, some of the work 
saying we talk about blight when we should talk about ruination, for instance, that we have a hard time finding the active verbs to describe what's happening um, in, uh, you know, a euphemism like distressed cities, uh, which it itself is like <laughs> not conveying this either. Um, but to just, you know, we talk about neighborhoods becoming blighted as if it's a natural process that's kind of biological rather than the policies that you can actually directly trace back that created um, the neighborhoods looking the way they do and then justified, um, you know, the legal designation of blighted, which then in turn justifies things like mass demolitions. Um, and so, which, which are also violent. And so um, we are kind of keeping at our disposal the whole range of, of ways in which this plays out, um, including the, you know, pretty directly violent um, dynamics. Um, so like within, within that arsenal of creative extraction, I think to some degree, I don't know, we've, we've like a lot of where I have gone in my research over the past few years has kind of gone into the realm of, of horror genres. And I think Danielle and I do talk about this a lot. Um, <laughs> where you, yes, the horror film, I mean, there's a reason why it comes together. So it's such a trope, right? Yeah. Um, and, I, and, and, and because it's sometimes like, you know, in a horror movie, you think about what makes things scarier is like the mundanity of like, and then things went back to normal. But what you realize is like, there is like what the normal is, is based on this foundation of blood basically. And, and so I think um, to the degree we are talking about like the creativity of creative extraction is that it's kind of grasping at whatever it can to like, build, you know, opportunistically use laws, policies, space, people, taxes, um, geography, all of that grasping to itself. And then at a given time, something may come up as being more useful or, um, and so it will kind of be incorporated. Um, and, and so we, I don't think we mean create creativity like in a good way <laughs> I mean like um, like like wow they really they really come up with so many ways to to do these um uh to to do that to reenact the same processes with new means um and that and and to kind of be like that means you can't just defeat the monster once you have to keep you have to keep seeing what new form it's taken and then defeat it again. But, you know, at its foundation, I think we want to put all the characters in the room so you can see who's doing what to whom and insist on that um, rather than it being like, oh, wow, why is this, you know, the equivalent of like a kid, like, why are you hitting yourself in the face, which is kind of the story we tell about black cities and neighborhoods most of the time. Um, of course, so creative, I actually, Danielle, I was thinking about this with respect to, you know, uh, the generative dimension of the representational work here, right? The two diagrams that you should, two illustrations, let's call them illustrations, right? And you are someone, that, as I understand it, who has come, uh, you think that academia can also have many platforms, right? With your work, it's Galloway, uh, storytelling, all sorts of stuff. So I, I wondered if you could, thinking about this framework of creative extraction, right? And thinking about this being a Zoom, I assume full of people who uh, are creative, more creative than me as a professionalist with that very visual design oriented, right? I'm wondering if you could talk about why, first of all, what you think an architect or a planner or a preservationist could, how they could be involved in the kind of creative representational work necessary, not just to visualize these structures, but also to think about them differently, right? To change them. And I'm wondering also how you think about it in your own work, working across these different platforms. Oh, that's a great question. Um... You know, I, I feel like I always, I often get this question about um, how people can intervene. And I, I often feel like stumped by it because it feels like so massive, right? Um, so many um, of our like interventions are like, um, are complicated by the fact that we're part of, right? Like structures that have specific rules that like, are intended, right, to like replicate, right, these um, uh, these same kind of structures. But one of the things that has been, I think, really useful for me, and I'm in this process right now. I live in um, 
I live in Durham, North Carolina, and I'm from, um, I'm actually from here. Um, and um, I feel like there's a lot of um, really deep, like listening and learning and study um, that has to happen um, in order for me to kind of understand like how, like, <laughs> in the sense, like how creative extraction is working in my city, in my place. And so one of like, you know, if I had any kind of advice, because I, again, I feel like sometimes it's hard to know like a thing to do or what to do. Um, I, you know, I always, I always think it's really important to start where you are um, and maybe start even where um, in places where you're familiar, um, you know, maybe where you're from, um, you know, as, you know, architects and planners, right, um, you know, you're, you're given a set of skills and a, and a way of seeing, right, um, that um, has really long histories and that we know, right, we have some sense, right, like, that can, um, you know, lend itself to practices that replicate these outcomes, even if you have no intentions to. And so one way um, to think about even shifting it in your mind, right, is this kind of, um, I think, deep observation, um, which is kind of one of our methods, <laughs> um, I think, in this process has been like, okay, here's a place that we don't know, right? But we, you know, we started, if I look back at our timeline, we started um, looking at Tamina back in 2016. Um, and, you know, it has taken us, um, you know, the, these articles were published in 2020 and it took us a really like a long, like deliberate time to really start to understand these dynamics, how they shifted, right? It took a while for, the community members there to trust us enough to like let us like in so that we could actually interview them. Um, and so, but it was really um, generative in the end and helping us to, to understand that. Um, so in terms of like, so I think deep listening, learning, and maybe preferably, <laughs> you know, with a place that you have some familiarity with and feel comfortable um, asking questions, right? Like about, um, uh, and then to see how it works in, in, in your place, right? Um, and then I think, you know, to answer your question about um, different platforms, um, I think it's massively important, right, to, and, you know, we're working on this now, right, to, um, to talk about these things publicly. Um, it's really, um, you know, it is not as nearly as rewarded in academia for speaking publicly about things that you're doing research on, even though public scholarship, as it were, is becoming a bit more acceptable. Um, but the impact of it is huge. Um, you know, I, in my own individual work, um, you know, in um, historic Black places in North Carolina and Alabama, um, you know, I wrote. Um, pretty um, extensively in public through Scalawag about these places and these patterns, right, that I was observing, um, you know, across the South in terms of infrastructure and access, right, and particularly around wastewater sanitation. And it's really amazing to see um, um, the kind of responsiveness that, um, that takes place, right? It turns out that a lot of these white places really do not like to be put on blast, right, publicly, right? They they do not, you know, and particularly I'm dealing with places that are quite small, right? Um, but even the bigger ones don't like it, but especially the small ones, the word gets around and people have a reputation to uphold. And, you know, sometimes what that means is um, people decide, right, to go back to the drawing board or to um, maybe hold off on a particular decision um, and to do something different because now they know people are watching, right? And that's important. It's just massively important. So, um, you know, I, you know, I don't pretend to be a planner or an architect. I think there's like some really brilliant creative work that can come out of thinking, doing this sort of deep observation um, and, um, we're writing about it, illustrating it publicly, um, helping us to understand how this 
you know, these processes work in, um, in other places. Right. Um, and so, you know, it's something that we're we're hoping to do some of ourselves, but um, this is definitely an open invitation <laughs> for other folks to, yeah, take a look, um, you know, be in touch. We'd love to, to see um, how people see it or could, you know, if it rings a bell with you in the places where you are. Um, excellent. Uh... Okay, there is a question. Um, where is this question, Reinhold? A secret question in oh, the Q&A. Let me see here. Uh, yeah, it's in the, in the Q&A. From Prem Sylvester, is that right, Prem? Um, I hope I said your name right. Thank you for such an insightful talk. I was wondering if you could speak to the importance of emphasizing the quote creative aspect of creative extraction rather than merely referring to extraction. We talked a bit about this, but yes, I mean, I think there's more to say. Thanks, Prem. Do you um, want to add to this? Uh, I think that Louis, was it Louise, you said, or both of you said that there is a kind of um, labor flexibility of, of these different mechanisms. And it really comes out in the articles, I'll say that you, it, you know, the, your main example is on a water infrastructure, but we're also talking about disposal, right? The disposal of bodies, right? The disposal of building debris, um, the, the question of um, obviously relevant for Benton Harbor and Whirlpool um, toxicity, right? Uh, like legacy chemicals, talk about a euphemism. Um, um, the question of also climate, uh, I don't know how to talk about the holding areas, right? You mentioned this too in a kind of question of the climate emergency. So these all seem to be potential fodder to, to open up Prem's question. Oh, I, yeah, I think, I mean, just to start with, we were um, thinking a lot about Joseph Schumpeter's creative destruction concept from the 50s. So he was an economist who was writing about this positively. And even if this isn't something that's familiar to you, you've, I mean, you, my son now is very well acquainted with the song Video Killed the Radio Star. Like we're, we're, we're familiar with the idea of like one technology has to murder off the previous technologies. Blockbuster is dead. Long live Netflix is, is the, is like the framework of creative destruction. And, and so like Schumpeter was positively describing capitalism as having to erase whatever came before it in order to like make an advance. Um, and we've kind of taken that on its head and like looked at how that works with um, extraction. Um, so that it's, it, I think it's to some degree, and I'll, I'll let Danielle take a stab at this too, but like, I think it's trying to show the, pos the positive side of like white development and its cost at the same time and, and always going back and forth across those two ways of seeing. Um, I think this also relates to why I write about debt a lot, not because I like finance, but because you can, you can kind of similarly think in terms of like positive and negative space and you have to switch modes of thinking all the time. So like some, you know, someone's benefit is my cost. And, um, and so I, I think the, the, the creativity of it is like, you don't have, like, I think this is also, again, what Daniel, what Daniel was saying about scale is it's often the same people who at one point are doing land grabs and at another point get into the water business and like, you know, and then they become the mayor. And so they often are like moving across these domains themselves, or if not that like Whirlpool is in Benton Harbor that they, you know, they started out as an industrialist and now they have this golf course. And how do we get from one thing to the next? So that, that they, they can move across domains um, easily and be thinking across all of these different ways of being in the city and like different uh, points of engagement with policy um, and officials and the state and um, like spaces and water environment like that they are thinking across all these places and so we have to as well and we are really not set up to do this as scholars we're supposed to focus you know be a water specialist or you know just do one area I just study pollution um, but like just like pollution does not stay in one place, but it enters into, um, you know, like we have to be thinking about the ground, the water and the air when we're thinking about contamination and how things move from one place to another. I feel similarly about how I'm kind of just following the story as it takes me different places. And, and I think that is like another aspect of that creativity that I was 
mentioning earlier. Yeah, and just quickly, I mean, I think, I mean, Louise, it's, it's spot on. I think the, um, you know, as we we're talking through this concept, um, Louise and I talked a lot about value, um, like valuation processes um, and how, like, <laughs> we think of, um, uh, we don't actually think very much. I mean, in some ways, I guess you think of like, all valuation is relative, right? Like there is, you know, you value one house at $100,000 and another at 30,000. And you have ostensibly a set of criteria, right? For how to do that, um, uh, how you get to that difference, right? Um, but, you know, when we think about um, how valuation works in terms of development, um, there is, you know, the, again, the narrative that we get all the time about development is sort of just this kind of like unidirectional, like um, sense of like creating wealth upon itself, <laughs> right? Like the valuation just sort of springs out of the air, right? People come together and then, then wealth just builds and accumulates. Um, and the way that we, <laughs> that we're observing it is that actually, right, like that valuation comes from somewhere, right? Like it is, it is created from something, right? And it is literally created, um, from the, from the land, from the physical resources, from the labor, right, of, um, these black places. Um, in my own, like my my own research, a lot of these places that um, um, are, you know, are on the site of former plantations, um, and they have these black places, and they have, you know, the white planter class, right? The, those um, those descendants who live in the city. Um, so much of why those black places are there were was a, a kind of bribe with land, right? To ensure that like um, this white place would forever have a black labor pool, right? That was helping to develop it, right? And when you think about it that way, like the, the creation of wealth, right? And the extraction is very clear, right? It seems very, um, very clear, but what, but you have to understand like, the history like of how those places came to be in order to start to understand what the relationship is. So that's that, but that's one iteration, right? Not every black place came off of a plantation and is adjacent to um, a place where the white planter class that had previously enslaved them live, right? But you can see very similar, right? Like kinds of patterns of extraction, um, you know, what happened to, how did black places create them like um, how were black places created and where were they created, um, you know, during the great migration, for instance, right? Um, how do we understand um, something like a sundown town, right? Like legit, like it's not, it's not no black people allowed ever at all, right? In this white place, it's like you are allowed here to work and to contribute your labor and to like build our wealth, right? but you cannot reside here. You cannot actually enjoy the, the literal fruits of your labor. You have to leave, right? So those sundown towns are actually mostly outside of the South, right? And so having, um, yeah, so there's a lot of like, it's, it's all there, right? Um, it's just about how um, we think about uh, what it means to be, what it means for wealth, right, um, to be created, right? Like, what is that process? We are really, um, I think at this point, kind of obsessed, right, with like, how is this the process of like wealth and valuation happen? Um, and like, you know, in the sundown towns, just as in the plantation towns, right, um, what we see is that like, like the white places, like sense of itself and value is directly predicated, right, on, um, on what it can extract, right? And land labor resources from the, from the black places. And they don't even have to be adjacent, right? Like, um, you know, a really great example is where I live now. I live in Durham. 
um, North Carolina. I, you know, teach at UNC Chapel Hill. Both of these places um, don't dump their waste in town, right? Both of these places dump their waste in a, um, a Black place in a county in Eastern North Carolina over 100 miles away, right? And so that extraction happens <laughs> um, in all sorts of, um, in all sorts of ways and it devalues, right? And it forecloses um, all sorts of possibilities for what that Black place can become uh, when that happens. Thanks for that. We have a couple more questions from David Crockett. Uh, apologies to be joining late. So if you've already answered this, please, please forgive me. I have wondered how work on so-called underdevelopment, so Manny Marvel's work, um, how uh, informs your work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so thank you. This is a great question. So we had talked a little bit earlier about um, uh, oh my God, the how Europe underdeveloped Africa, right? Um, and, and how colonialism, we kind of have some sense of um, how extraction um, in this sense um, operates on the international scale. Um, and you're talking about Manny Marable's work. Um, yeah, I think it's, I, I think that um, it relates directly, right? Like uh, Manny Marable's work is in conversation with um, Cedric Robinson's work on racial capitalism is in conversation with um, Charles Mills's work on the racial contract. I think, um, you know, what these folks are describing are sort of um, like the view from like, you know, uh, 3000 feet of like how um, how these processes work to um, un, like of development and underdevelopment. And um, what we're doing is basically like, like, like doing a um, zoom, sorry, zooming in, right? Sorry, we're on zoom, we're zooming into um, at the scale of the locality, right? And seeing how like, you know, even without thinking about thinking very much about the federal government, right? Like each government at each level, right? Um, has this has this ability, <laughs> right? To, to operate um, in this particularly, um, in this particular way that replicates something that we think of, again, at a much larger level. And so, you know, rather than dealing with things like the GI Bill, right? And like sort of those broad redlining processes as we think of sort of big federal like, you know, programs that created these development outcomes. We're looking at like municipal utility districts, right? Like that's, and so it's really just, again, um, um, a, a matter of um, the scale and mechanism of it, I would say. If, if I can emphasize this, I think this is a really important point that you've said several times in this question of scale. I think that what your work is bringing to the table, and I think as an example for um, you know people who are going out in the world and, and engaging with community economic development interfaces and this kind of stuff, is precisely you know you can talk about these broad mechanisms, col colonization, decolonization, whatever you know fill in the blank or settler whatever it is these kinds of paradigms that become kind of roll off the tongue these days. But the work of actually tackling them would require you to ask about extreme tax regression and property taxes, right? Which seniors get tax breaks and why? Um, what I really appreciate about the articles is question of air property, right? These really nitty gritty uh, things that I think that planners and architects are in a position to open the books on, right? Because they're there for the taking, right? So what is air property, right? What is the tax regression? Where, where which, which part of the county can negotiate different tax rates, right? These are really critical questions that of course can fall under these big bra uh, branches of, of, of racial capitalism, but in order to actually find a place to move things around and create a different kind of illustration, that's where the pressure is put, right? So I really appreciate that Danielle keeps on coming back to this question of scale, nuance, the local, as not incidental here, but where the work is done to reimagine this kind of structure. So that's obviously. Yeah, it, if I could say one thing about that, I think that, I, I completely agree. And I think we often think about big picture, like the wealth must be made, you know, out in the realms of trillions of dollars, but it's, you know, like the bank's wealth is generated from like 
mortgage interest and and water bills and people paying two dollar fees and so just in the same way like what we're seeing you know we we have a hard time thinking about like big picture like structural racism but you can actually show the person doing making the decision that did the thing at these scales you can often actually see it take place in front of your eyes at a meeting and so um you you both have like it's the picture is clearer and also it's really important to study this and, and to to reiterate that a bunch of many planners and designers and architects are in a position to see this play out in front of their eyes like a lot of times um I started I came into this studying I will not get into what they are but um tax increment financing arrangements in Benton Harbor and 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 caused me to realize like this is where like in this case the 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 financing for this very big half billion dollar development was being reimbursed partially through um through uh, city taxes and school uh, taxes that should have gone to schools for the next uh, 20 plus years. And then the school district was virtually going bankrupt. Um, and we weren't supposed to think of these two things as connected. And, and so part of this is just um, trusting your instinct that when you see uh, something happen and then something com you can come afterwards that maybe they actually are connected, but that a lot of the times the financing that we'll talk about like Hudson Yards, bajillion dollar projects, but that it comes from similar types of um, financing schemes that ultimately kind of hinge on similarly extractive policies um, to understand why that's relevant to Flint. You'll have to read my book in several years, but, but, but that we, <laughs> this is my first plug ever, um, but, we, you know, we, um, it can be easy to kind of exist in this like abstracted realm, but a lot of times when you trace back where that money came from that is financing the thing that you are affiliated with, it, it does, it's not coming from the ether, it's coming from like people's pocketbooks. And, um, and when you are at that smaller scale, you can watch the money kind of travel from place to place in ways that you can then kind of scale up in your analysis. Um, but but that is easier to see. I, I would just add a plug for Clyde Woods's book, Arrested Development, which was really formational for me um, when Xandria Robinson told me to read it, like 2013. And 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 he said like in the first chapter, like the Delta looks the way it does, not from uh, too little but too much capitalism. And I was like, whoa, I gotta <laughs> do something with this, like like that that we see places that have been suffering from too much capitalism as being underdeveloped and that they are both like under and overdeveloped at the same time or what underdevelopment really means in this case. So thanks for your question, David. Uh, which is amazing, okay. Um, so we are a little over eight. We, you know, there's more to be said um, if there are no questions from the group, but I also want to um, um, where I am is quite warm, so I wonder if these folks are in a hot seat as well. Um, so, uh, uh, are there more questions from from our audience, whose faces I can't see, but I'm hoping are, are having all sorts of ideas? My silent friend Reinhold, is there something that you would like to say? Well. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I've come back. Well, first of all, uh, in uh, you know, it, it it does seem like this con this conversation, first of all, has continued from the many, and it's been a real pleasure, you know, listening in again, and and uh, and it can continue, I, I think, uh, in many of the directions that that you, uh, Cassie, have have already laid out, and that that Louise and Danielle have in in their own work. Um, in the spirit of kind of on, ongoing uh, work, uh, uh, Jacob, I think it was posted earlier, and I'm just able to post again, the link to, um, to, to the Buell Center Power uh, Infrastructure in America site, uh, in which um, there you'll find further information on, on Danielle's and Louise's project and its links to other work that we've been doing at the Buell Center and in, in again, an extension, including a, a collaboration with Scalawag uh, mentioned uh, earlier. So, you know, uh, kind of proliferating 
uh, connections. And, and so I, I, you know, just really want to say again, how, how honored uh, I think we've been to, to be able to at least um, in, in these ways, host such uh, amazing work and, and such a great conversation. Uh, and I did want to give Danielle and Louise just a, a chance if they wanted to say any, any concluding, uh, make any concluding offer including thoughts or anything or, or, or uh, whatever, as we all enter into the summer evening. Are you there? Yeah. Um, I, thank you, Reinhold. I, um, I don't know that I have any, um, anything else to contribute um, at this point, but um, I think I will say that um, it's been really amazing to have this time, um, you know, this uh, to do this project and to dig in in the ways that we have. Um, it's you know, academic time is, as so many of you know, <laughs> um, really precious, and it's um, to have the support um, of um, of the Buell Center through this process. Um, was really um, foundational, right, and, and, and essential for us to um, to get this work done. Um, we have more work to come, um, and um, so I would just encourage you. You know, I guess we're both on Twitter and <laughs> and that kind of thing. We we tweet at each other and we tweet um, about our work pretty frequently. Um, and um, yeah, we're just looking forward to um, more uh, public uh, discourse about creative extraction, about um, the particular case of Tamina as it continues to unfold. Um, and um, yeah, looking forward to any of the kind of feedback uh, that y'all might have um, or in other places you might, you know, on occasion people uh, message us and say like, oh, have you looked into this in that other place? And we, we really like that. <laughs> um, so we, um, yeah, we, we certainly encourage that if, um, if, if this um, kind of thing interests you, um, but yeah, but thank you. Yeah, I want to, I want to uh, reiterate all, all of that. And I, I think in particular, it's been great that like since we're coming to this from different disciplines, I mean, we are both English majors and sometimes we trot out this fact at random times that like we both didn't start where we are now and that um, it's been, oh, apparently Catherine as well. <laughs> no wonder we're talking about metaphor. Um, but, uh, you know, to be able to like work with a, a center for architecture and planning has been really helpful, I think to get, outside like sociologists have a certain way they want me to talk about what I do and I'm sure the experience is the same thing um environmental policy and you know, geography and that without having that same restriction to just think about like what's important what's translating across audiences how might professional people be thinking about what we want to do um that that it helps you know, it, 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 it takes all of those restraints off so that we can just be like, what is our case study saying rather than like, what, what would sociology want me to do to translate this into legibility for them? And I, I actually, I feel like our work got a lot better because we could think about how to translate it for different audiences um, rather than our own. And, and so thank you for that, for, for being willing to, to, to like think about how your work works with social science. Um, and how, how this like design, like how this concrete and abstract processes work together. It's been really interesting. Well, likewise for us. And in fact, to come even more full circle, uh, you, you, as you've been speaking, our architectural colleague, Anna Maria Leon, uh, with whom we have also had the opportunity to collaborate around uh, the question of emergency powers in, in uh, Detroit, um, has posted uh, some reflections really I'm just, you know, speaking so you have a chance to read them, everybody. <laughs> uh, on Du Bois's uh, thoughts, uh, observations about white planters looking even further south um, to uh, Latin America um, uh, and uh, a kind of as a reminder that, that we here at the Buell Center for the study of American architecture, whatever that could possibly 
uh, are, are inherently responsible for this question of the, the relation and or distinction between America, i.e. US, and Americas, i.e. Um, the North-South axis that, that Ana Maria is referring to. Uh, but that's for another time for sure. Uh, in the meantime, I just wanted to thank everybody again and thanks so much, Cassie, for, uh, for your you know, uh, wonderful um, interlocution uh, and, and commentary also, I have to say, on, on the work. Uh, so to be continued in, in, in many, many ways. Okay, okay, well, good evening, good night, <laughs> wherever you are.